everyone, uh, my name is Jamie Warfield. For those who don't know who I am, I am your Sexual Assault Response Coordinator for the 153rd Airlift Wing. Um, and I hope that this message finds everybody safe and healthy and happy. I know times are so weird right now and, and it's weird teaching to a room of zero people, sorry, one person. Uh, and uh, so just bear with me a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and go through our this year's Green Dot training. Um, we call it Green Dot, but it's really not Green Dot anymore. We're not doing bystander intervention anymore. Um, I'd like to kind of walk through more, uh, more response techniques and ways to care about one another and, and support one another who, uh, who may have been hurt or who may have been victimized by a sexual assault. So um, the way that I like to kind of compare this is, is with tourniquet training. So ask yourself, do you know how to properly apply a tourniquet to someone's arm, for example, who may be bleeding out? Most of you do. Uh, the reason that you know that isn't necessarily because you've done it before, because you've performed that on somebody who was actually bleeding, who was actually um, at risk of losing a limb or losing a life. The reason you know is because of training and because of practice. Um, most of us have had the hands-on training. We've applied a tourniquet to someone who wasn't actually bleeding out, um, obviously not as tight, uh, but we know how it works. We pull the, you know, we, we, we twist the bar, we wrap it around two inches above the wound, one inch above the wound. It's been a while for me. Um, so, so what's the goal when you're applying a tourniquet? The goal is to stop the bleeding. That is the ultimate goal. That is the immediate response that we want as people who aren't necessarily medical professionals. We want to stop the bleeding. Also ask yourself, is this person who, who is requiring the tourniquet going to suffer long-term effects from what happened to them? Absolutely, whether that's loss of a limb, whether that's aggressive scarring, um, whether, you know, whether that's PTSD, those types of things will come after a tourniquet's applied, okay? I'd like to ask you to compare that to somebody who's been victimized by sexual assault. Um, so, so the ultimate goal still is to stop the bleeding. So if somebody comes to you who is bleeding, who is hurting, who, who has been victimized, who has been assaulted, whether that was five years ago, 10 years ago, or whether it was a few hours ago, stop the bleeding. That is the new goal. Um, again, the way that we're gonna learn how to do this is through practice and through training. That's why this training is so crucial to, to, um, to be able to respond to this type of trauma. Uh, and also understand that this person is going to suffer tremendously from this afterwards, whether it's loss of a limb, whether it's feeling like something is missing, right? Just like a, just like a blood, bloody injury, um, scarring. This person is gonna have PTSD from this for the rest of their lives. This isn't something that you can fix, okay? It is something that you can respond to immediately. And the way that you respond will affect their healing. If you apply that tourniquet correctly, they will live and they will survive with some scarring. So your response to this is, is crucial to their recovery and the way that they move through life in the future. So please, please, please remember that when, when we have the urge to be investigators and we have the urge to ask a thousand questions or tell them what we think is best for them and, and force them to do something. Um, so the first few steps, totally goof proof, goof proof. The first few things you say, three main things, okay? I am so sorry about what happened to you. I am so sorry. Be empathetic, tell them that, let them know. Don't tell them that you know how they feel. Don't tell them that you don't wanna hear it or that you don't believe them, okay? I am so sorry that that happened to you. Number two, are you safe right now? right this moment, where are you, are you safe? That question is crucial because you don't know if that person is still in the house with their abuser, you don't know if that person has fled the scene, if that person um, is, is, has wandered off, you don't know, you know, if the assault happened years ago, you don't know if that person is having suicidal thoughts. So are you safe is, is a very important question to ask. Number three, how can I help? How can I help? Don't force your help. Don't say, all right, we're going to see this arc. All right, we're, we're going to the police right now. How can I help? What do you need in this moment? That might be a ride. 
That might be a, a listening ear. That might be the SARC or the DPH or the chaplain. How can I help? Where can I bring you? What can I do? Um, that is super, super important to making sure that the victim is feeling taken care of. And again, that applies to whether it just happened or whether it happened a long time ago, because the help that they need right now may just be a listening ear or someone who's willing to empathize with them, okay? Um, let the victim have control. This is really important. When somebody has been victimized, their control has been taken away from them in that moment. Don't re-victimize them by taking the control away. Don't force them to do something that they don't want to do, regardless of how much you think it will benefit them in that moment. Give them their options and let them decide and escort them and get them to wherever they need to go. Um, again, those, those resources are, are plentiful. Those resources are myself, uh, the SARC, uh, the DPH is coming on soon, as well as the chaplain. And also know that we practice among one another this as well. If someone comes to me and I say, if, if I think they should go see the chaplain, I will offer that resource, but I will not force them to go down to the chaplain. I will not make them feel as though they don't have a choice. A, same with the DPH and the chaplain. They will ask if, if the victim wants to come see me um, as the SARC and, and discuss their options with reporting. So, so know that and try to be that person. Uh, don't forget that mandatory reporters are supervisors, first sergeants, commanders, um, security forces members, and some medical personnel. So when, when we're disclosing things or when we're, you know, if, if you're victimized personally and you want to talk to somebody about it, just realize that those people, letting those people know is gonna limit your options in your reporting. So that's really important to know whether, you're, whether you've been victimized or whether you're responding to somebody who's disclosed their victimization to you. Um, be very careful, and we'll talk about that a little bit as the training goes on. Um, things to say and things not to say. Uh, we already went over the three main things, right? I am so sorry that happened to you. How can I help? And are you safe? Okay. Um, what are some other things to say? Some other things to say are, are you know, how is this affecting your daily life? Um, how can I support you in the future? Why, you know, why do you scratch that? That's not a thing. Um, things not to say, obviously. And we've, we've talked about this in past trainings. Um, why were you there? Were you drinking alcohol? Um, why did you give that person your phone number? Why did you go to their home? Why, um, why did you wear that? Why, you know, why were you alone? That type of stuff. Our first reaction is to get the story, and I understand that. And you may have the best intentions behind asking those questions. Um, who, who assaulted you? Even that can be very um, investigative and victim blamey. So what you're telling the victim is that they made the mistake of being in a certain place or wearing a certain thing or drinking too much alcohol and that they deserved what happened to them. We want to avoid that at all costs. Um, that can be very, very detrimental to the wound that has occurred on this person. So victim blaming and self-blame are, are very, very, very common, even if that's not what our goal is or what we want to do. And if they do decide to file an unrestricted report, those questions are going to get asked um, by OSI, by the police, um, likely by their supervision, unfortunately. So don't be another person that is digging into what happened and, and even, even um, inconsistencies in their story. Um, another thing to understand is their story is going to be inconsistent if, if they've experienced a traumatic event. That is normal brain functioning um, for people who have experienced trauma that, and not just sexual trauma, any sort of trauma. People often forget things. People block things out of their brains. That is normal. Unfortunately, it decreases their credibility to the general public. That is understandable. So when that person is remembering things slowly, encourage that. Encourage um, active listening and, and encourage, and tell them it's okay for inconsistencies in their stories because that is normal. 
Um, this next section, I, I cannot stress this enough. Uh, I, am, I am so far behind this next statement that I'm willing to put my job on the line for it. Uh, if you are not comfortable responding to a sexual assault, or if you are not confident in your response capabilities, or if you, do not if you cannot find it in your heart to believe the person who has disclosed this to you, or find it in your heart to care about the person that's disclosed this to you, please, please, please find someone who does. That is the best thing you can do for that person. Um, obviously, I do, okay? So find me, find any of my victim advocates. There are five of them. Um, we've got Master Sergeant Heather Smith, uh, Senior Master Sergeant Victoria Lopez, Major Leanna Thomas, uh, Master Sergeant M Michelle Adolf, and Master Sergeant Jennifer Ballinger. They are amazing volunteer victim advocates. They, they will be those caring people, okay? They are also capable of listening to a story about assault without having any sort of report come out of it. So please, please, please keep that in mind. If you are not capable of doing this, find someone who is. That is so important and that is the best thing you can do for this wing and for this program. Uh, that being said, um, this wing has done nothing but impress me. I had quite a few cases last year in 2019, quite a few, and 90% of them were referred to me by friends and peers and people who cared. Uh, this means that you all are stepping up and you know where to go if someone's been hurt and you know how to help them. I am so impressed and I'm so proud of all of you for that. I cannot even put into words how much that means to me and my program that, um, that you can walk somebody into my office and get them the help that they need. That is incredible and it's not something that a lot of SARCs see. So that definitely says something about the 153rd. It says something about the Wyoming Military Department in general. And, um, and I'm so proud of you. So keep that up. This has been really great. Okay. Uh, what I can offer. So there's a lot of things that my program can offer, either officially or unofficially. So we're going to talk a little bit about the reporting options because that's been missing from the training for quite a while for a few years now, and, and it's important that we all become clear on this because the last thing I want to do is to get into a situation where an unrestricted report is opened against the victim's will, because we just talked about why it's so important for them to have control, right? So unrestricted reporting versus restricted reporting, okay? We're going to talk about restricted first. This is the option that is most suitable for most of my victims, and, and I say that because that's what they're choosing more and more often. Um, restricted reporting means that you come to me or a victim advocate and or are referred to me or you come with a friend, you can come with whoever you want, and unless it's a mandatory reporter. Um, and we sit down and we talk, you know, you tell me as much as you want to tell me, you know, it can be five seconds long, it could be three hours long, I've experienced both. Um, and we'll get you filling out a restricted report, which means that nobody even knows your name. So we're not going to start an investigation. We're not going to do anything like that. The only thing that's going to happen is I'm going to be able to legally get you resources, whether that is counseling locally, whether that is a victim advocate, or, or some advice from a special victim's counsel, or um, anything like that. So your name will never be brought up. Your, your command will never know that you came to me. Um, it, it's completely private. And once you fill out the report, that goes into the system and it gets shredded. It's not even in the universe anymore. So um, I like to start victims out that way. Unrestricted reporting is much different. And I encourage both depending on what the victim's needs are. Uh, but the unrestricted reporting means that uh, your command will be notified that this occurred. Um, they will be given a lot of the details basically when it happened, who the assailant may have been, um, things like that. It'll also be discussed in our monthly SARB, which is a sexual assault response board, and your name will be brought up, and that's where we make sure that we're getting you everything that you need. So that includes a victim advocate, that includes mental health services, that you know, we talk about um, what type of repercussions are coming out of the, you know, the commander's 
decision for the assailants. We talk about everything. And, and the goal of that meeting is to make sure that you are getting exactly what you need in life, whatever we can help with. Um, so there's positives, absolutely. The thing about an unrestricted report is that it requires an investigation. On active duty, that looks a little bit different. On active duty, that is OSI 99% of the time. In the National Guard, it's funky. So it, we, depending on who was on orders, who wasn't on orders, when this happened, you know, who the perpetrator was, whether they were in the military at all, it may be investigated by local police, it may be investigated by OSI if everyone was on orders, it may be you know, something totally different. OCI is a thing too. So it looks a little funky, but a request, an investigation is required. My, when, when I have victims that decide to file an unrestricted report, my biggest question is whether, I have two questions, whether they're willing to go through this process for several years, because oftentimes it does take at least one year, I've seen it take up to three um, of questioning and, and dragging out legal processes and waiting, a lot of waiting. And I also ask them if they are going to be okay if it's either dismissed or if the subject is, is not apprehended. Um, because that's really important because my main goal is the welfare of that survivor, that victim, okay? So um, those are the main two things. You can go from a restricted report to an unrestricted report very easily. You can't go back. So please know that as well. When you're, whether you've been victimized or whether you're a survivor um, or whether you're a responder to this, make sure that the person that you're talking to who's just disclosed to you that they've been hurt, make sure that they know that. Um, and I obviously will make sure of that as well. Um, I, offer, I also offer mental health referrals. So you can come to me Hypothetically, you could come to me and say, hey, I know someone, um, I'm not going to tell you who they are, I need, I need some resources, I need some help. I can give that to you. I mean, that's, I'm happy to give that to you. I've had people come into my office and tell me every dirty detail of what happened to them and not make a report. And that's okay, too. Um, I, I am the person you can come talk to about these things, as well as the DPH and the chaplain. You will never be pressured into doing something that you don't want to do. Uh, so mental health referrals, uh, general advice for helpers and victims. Again, if you're a commander, if you're a supervisor, if you suspect that somebody may have been hurt, if someone in your family has been hurt, I can provide those resources. I know plenty in the Cheyenne area, Northern Colorado area, Laramie, um, and we can get that to you very, very easily. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about, because we are all staying at home more often now, uh, just, I, I want to encourage everyone to remember that not everyone is using this as a time of rest. This may not be peaceful and restful for a lot of people that we work with and that we interact with on a daily basis. Remember that a lot of people are single mothers and fathers who are not used to working from home and have their kids at home right now, and even, even couples who aren't used to it. Um, reach out to those people. They may be struggling. Um, Remember those who may be cohabitating right now with their abusers. Think of people who may be in abusive relationships that are stuck in this house with this person who may not be safe. Reach out to these people. Um, remember those who may be feeling very isolated. Not everyone has a family. A lot of people live alone. A lot of extroverts live alone. Make sure that we're communicating and talking to those people. You all have each other's phone numbers. If you don't have each other's phone numbers, you, have each, you can find people on social media. Um, you can find people through friends or other coworkers. So please keep that in mind. This is very important at a time like this. Um, don't feel like you always need to be super productive. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to rest. Um, it's okay to reach out. No one is going to be annoyed by someone who is caring about them. Um, so please keep that in mind. A lot of people staying at home may be feeling like they're staying in a prison. So um, it, it's important to me that everyone is communicating at a time like this and that we remain the wing that I know that we are, this loving, caring, supportive brother and sisterhood that we are. Um, again, I cannot be more proud of everybody. And, and I reached out and I've had a lot of people reach out to me and it's been amazing. Um, so we're alone together. It's very weird <laughs> right now. Um, 
And I just kind of want to end on a note of, um, I have this written outside my office, but Mother Teresa said that the reason that we have no peace is because we've forgotten that we belong to each other. So please remember that we do belong to each other. We are responsible for one another. And, um, and now more than ever, it's, it's important to, to stay in contact and to stay close. <laughs>